Hey guys, welcome to another exciting episode of the Yes Users podcast. Today, we have a truly inspiring guest with us, Mr. Suraj Divakaran. He is a B2B marketing maestro with a stellar track record at industry giants like Lenovo, Infosys, TCS and Logitech. He is not just a marketer, but an award-winning content creator and a passionate Gen AI enthusiast. Currently, he is making waves at Maxwell Group Inc. and sharing his insights on a popular blog called Digital Uncovered. With over 10,000 followers and a wealth of experience, Suraj is here to share his journey, insights, and the secret behind his marketing magic. So buckle up and get ready for an enlightening conversation. So, Suraj, welcome to Yes Users Podcast. Thanks, Abhinash, for having me. So, how are you feeling? Good. It's a Saturday. Yeah. Um, you always feel ex- more excited about the weekend. It's sure. a weekday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Suraj, you have been doing tremendous work. But for our listeners who are not aware or who don't know you, uh, please give them a brief introduction of yourself. So I've been a marketer for uh, 15 plus years now and I initial 5-6 years of my career were spent in B2C. The last 8 or 10 years have been in the uh, B2B side. Uh, so i worked with several companies uh, in the consumer technology space and also education right in the beginning. So currently I manage marketing for a software firm which is based out of Los Angeles. Uh, much of the work happens in India, but uh, we sell to companies and law firms in North America and Europe. So that's my corporate avatar. But I also do other things. Uh, so I have a blog that I've been managing for the last 15 years, which does some reasonable traffic. Uh, and trying to build a community for B2B marketers. Uh, so that has been in works for the last four or five months. We did one event in Bangalore. We are planning a second one in Chennai. I also write a lot, see, see a lot of my content across different sites, uh, some of which I own and some of which are owned by other publications. Uh, and also teach. Uh, so I teach at a few places. I usually teach content marketing. I teach at Stoa and I teach at a couple of other places. And uh, I do impromptu calls as well. So a lot of times people reach out to me and yeah, uh, I'll be speaking to them for 30, 45 minutes without any agenda, just censoring them out. I think that's just a way of sort of helping people out because they were not many people who helped me out when I started my career. So I figured that I'm sort of morally obligated to help other people out. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much what I do. So most of my weekends are spent on doing all these things which are outside of work. Absolutely. You know, great thing. Uh, and you know, uh, for people, uh, I just wanted to let you know, we also started like an impromptu call. Like we are speaking on podcast publication, you were giving me inputs. And I was like, like this guy knows really what I'm going through. And, uh, and you know, very interestingly, you talked about uh, selling the products to law firms, right? Because this is what I've been doing for past couple of years now. So tell us about uh, what unique challenges it brings. So we try to sell to patent attorneys and trademark attorneys sitting out of uh, North America and Europe. The biggest problem that you have is the traditional channels that you have like Google and LinkedIn and all those other channels don't work for you. So we've spent money on uh, performance marketing and burned our fingers. So your single lead would come to us around $2,000, $3,000. So when we tried doing a campaign on LinkedIn, it was another $400, $500 per lead. So we quickly realized that performance marketing as a channel wouldn't work for this category. Because if you look at the number of patent and trademark attorneys, right, people who specialize in IP, it's just 10, 20 lakh people, right, spread across North America and Europe. So what works for us is traditional marketing, right? Email marketing, webinars, events, account-based marketing, inbound marketing. So that is what works for us. So over the last three and a half, four years that I've been with this company, uh, the focus has been using these channels and growing the sales pipeline. And interestingly, uh, the c- current company that I work for, sales and marketing is one integrated team. So you have much higher visibility into what is happening from a sales perspective. So we don't measure ourselves just based on MQLs that we generate. We also look at 
what was the ECV, what does marketing's contribution to sales pipeline, how much time does it take for a lead to convert, right? And we have different products. We have products which have very low ticket size. We have products which have very high ticket size. So the same cycle also varies. So there are some complications involved. Uh, but overall, I think the market is also maturing. And there is this whole perception in the market that uh, lawyers are these different animals. You can't <laughs> yeah. market to them. They are not emotional. So you also, you also try to at least do some tweaks in the copy, some tweaks in the content to make sure that you also appeal to them at an emotional level. That's a journey, right? Because it's when we're trying to sell it internally, there is some resistance also because there are some preconceived notions about lawyers and how you market to them. I think all of us have gone through those struggles. <laughs> I can completely relate to your observations. As a lawyer uh, myself, I can understand the preconceived notions people have for us. And very interestingly, I was also, when I was practicing law, I was also a trademark attorney. Uh, <laughs> Very interesting, uh, you know, uh, overlap there. So you you spoke about a couple of terms which I couldn't understand, like you know, inbound marketing, ACV. So please explain that for layman like. Yeah. So I think you have to start off with the sales cycle, right? Because in B two B, you are very close to the sales cycle, right? So there is a point in time where a customer comes to you, and there is a point at which he converts, right? And the time frame between him coming to you for the first time and him converting could be anywhere from around a week to one, one and a half weeks, depending upon what you are trying to sell him. So if you're trying to sell him a service, which is like $300, $400, you might be able to convert the customer in a couple of weeks. But if you're trying to sell a customer a product, which is one, one and a half million dollars, it's going to take you one, one and a half years to convert that. that that's your typical sales cycle, right? So when the lead comes to you, the lead is called an MQM. Right, and when the lead converts, we call it a D. Right, so you have multiple steps in between MQL, SQL, and MQL is marketing qualified lead, SQL is sales qualified lead. Uh, then you have sales accepted lead, and then some point in time you say that there is a clear opportunity, and we can sell to them. And at some point in time, that opportunity becomes a D, which is basically the D gets closed. Okay, so ACV is the average contract value. What is the average contract value of the D? Right. So what we do is because we have products and services, so we, we come out with an average, right? Uh, in some companies, they also call it TCD, which is total contract value, right? So if you sold somebody something which is uh, worth um, $1 million, then the total contract value is uh, $1 million, right? Now, all of this is tracked at the sales level, right? But in B2B, since you're so close to sales, you have to track all of this, right? So what we try to do is if you have to sell Let's say you want to do a business of around $30 million, right? You have to create a pipeline of roughly around $100 million, right? Because if your conversion from MQ to D is 30%, which means that you need deals for $100 million to get to $30 million. Now the question is, what percentage of that pipeline of $100 million can marketing generate? So usually that number is around 10 to 20%. Right, rest eighty percent always comes from sales, and this is a sales-led model. It's not a product-led model where you have premium and trials and all of that. Right. So what we are trying to optimize for is a couple of things. We are trying to make sure that a certain percentage of the pipeline comes from uh, marketing. We want to make sure that certain number of MQLs are generated. We also want to make sure that certain number of SQLs are generated, and we also want to make sure certain percentage of deals come from marketing. Mostly that number is 10 20%, right? So today, 10 to 20% of the conversions actually come from the work that marketing does. And I think the more you can contribute to the pipeline, the more you can contribute to the deals, you get a seat on the table because you have a direct impact on the p and uh, which is not something that a lot of uh, B2C brands usually think of. Usually the tracking ends at MQL uh, because what happens is a lot of companies, sales and marketing are separate teams. So the marketing team is just asked to generate leads, hand it over to sales, and then they don't know what has to with it. And uh, at the end of the year, the CMO will go and say, oh, we did awareness campaign, we generated X number of emails, but they don't have visibility into the sales cycle. But in typical B2B brands, at least an enterprise uh, side, this is how things work. Wow. 
you know that's that's a great explanation and you know you know something i feel a lot of saas entrepreneurs should be aware of because what happens is that you know i interact with a lot of entrepreneurs they always uh, go for the product led model for monetization right which is a great thing in itself right but what i feel is uh, that in in the initial days when you are really trying to hone on what is the problem what is the core problem that you are trying to solve having sales led model be- gives you better visibility because you are able to directly interact with the consumer and able to deeply understand what is their hidden motivations what are the typical hurdles that comes in the sales cycle that's what i say like uh, later on you can definitely scale through the product led marketing but the initial days going by the sales led uh, closing the deals is has its advantages i wanted to discuss this thing that you said that you know the performance marketing wasn't working for us right and that's again a situation where a lot of i would say saas entrepreneurs find themselves in and then you said like you know uh, we switched to the traditional marketing can you explain a little more what do you mean by traditional marketing yeah so if you look at how marketing was done in the 80s and 90s it was largely a mix of all of this email marketing events webinars account based marketing back then it was not called account based marketing right the term evolved somewhere in the early 90s it was called one to one marketing it had different names right so these were traditional channels that were used and somewhere towards the end of 90s came performance marketing right you had channels like google facebook came up somewhere in 2007 right and all these other channels got added to the mix still for a large cross section of businesses some of these channels don't work right because your audience is very niche so if i had to target ip professionals in north america at the max there would be a million people that i can target and these million people are not on a single platform they're spread across different platforms so what happens is when you start spending money on performance marketing because it's such a niche audience your cpc goes up your cost per click is very very high and especially if you are an unknown brand uh, you will end up spending a lot more than a known brand so what we realized is took some money spent it on linkedin and we started seeing that each lead was coming to us at around 400 500 dollars right and these were nqls these were not even conversions these these were not estimates uh similarly we spent some money on google each lead was coming to us around 2000 3000 dollars so it didn't make sense for us so when i do marketing through the traditional channels that company is in email marketing events webinars uh, my cost per conversion is something around 300 400 dots right so why would i end up spending so much money on google and linkedin and this is a problem that some categories or some niches have in the technology space that performance marketing as a channel doesn't work for them absolutely absolutely and to be honest there is not a lot of material out there to tackle this problem because as i told you this is a problem that i myself have faced a lot and uh, we landed on the same conclusion as you so just to clarify when uh, surat says events like it's uh, for his case would be going to events where uh, ip lawyers are coming and then going and meeting them uh, like you know introducing yourself and saying okay this is uh, one of the things that we do like uh, for ip lawyers there is an event called inta inta right right so that's like the most important event where almost anybody who's even somebody in the ip industry would be there so you would go there as an as a representative of the company and webinars would be like you know what are the general problems that ip attorneys face uh, and kind of creating webinars on like what are the best practices for ip valuation what are the best practices of ip management similar and goes on so that would be uh, the you know uh, traditional that's what he meant uh, by going into the traditional uh, mode of marketing you can correct me if i'm wrong no 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 you are absolutely bang on uh, i think the larger problem and i might be slightly doing a segue from what you're talking about the larger problem i see in industry is that when you are hiring people now a lot of people say i want to be a digital marketer and i want to manage performance marketing spends of 10 lakhs 15 lakhs 20 lakhs but this is what you have to understand if you are going for an interview for a company that company is trying to solve a very particular problem it has right it wants to grow its sales pipeline get more deals and all of that so you have to scale what works right if performance marketing doesn't work for you you have to you have to cut it down and spend somewhere else right i think that's one of the 
fundamentals that a lot of people who come for interviews today miss out on. They say, I want to do digital marketing and I want to do performance marketing. Yeah. In some cases, it will not work. So you'll have to do what works for your company, right? Tomorrow, if you become a CMO somewhere, you can't be going and saying, oh, my expertise is performance marketing. I'm going to try this, no matter it works or not. Yeah. <laughs> and a simple hack I share with uh, young people is that uh, whomsoever you are uh, interviewing for, go on their website. Uh, should, do they have a start your free trial button? Or yeah. they, do they have a book a meeting button on their website at, at, at the top corner? This yeah. this just looking at this will make you uh, just make you understand that they are bullish on marketing or whether they are bullish on sales more. Yeah, uh, There are other ways to look at this as well, right? Like So there are platforms where you can go and check whether a particular brand is running a performance marketing campaign or not. Like you can go to Semrush or Spyfu and you can put in the URL and you can figure out whether these guys are running performance marketing or not. If that particular brand is not running a performance marketing campaign and your goal is to be a performance marketer, then probably don't apply for the job. Absolutely. And you know, this is the least you can do as a marketer to kind of have like spend 15 minutes on researching the firm. And to be honest, I think if something like that happens, it makes our life easier because we know that guy isn't the right fit anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think the, the larger issue that we have today is everybody looks at that easy apply button and clicks on it. Uh, they don't think about the company. They don't look at the job description. And when you go there, that's when you realize that, oh, this is not aligned to what I'm thinking. Well said. I couldn't agree more. So now we are talking about B2B marketing and we're talking about like uh, marketing to lawyers, right? Now, I want to go even deeper. Uh, a lot of people might think you know, the legal guy bana diya hai. but uh, I believe uh, for legal tech uh, entrepreneurs, I think uh, you are definitely one of the top 10 people they should be consulting when it comes to their uh, marketing strategies. So I want to dig a little bit deeper. Market lawyers, there are two types of lawyers. One is in-house lawyers and one are the lawyers who are working in a law firm. Now, I know your company markets to both. So yeah. tell us about what works for one set and doesn't work for the other. And how do you uh, market to both of these uh, set of lawyers effectively? See, how services and products get sold today, especially in the IT industry. And this is irrespective of IP tech and legal tech. Is products and services are sold on functional benefits. What are functional benefits? Time, efficiency, right? Say, for instance, if you are trying to sell paralegal as a service, the major reason why a law firm or a company would opt for paralegal services, they want to offload this work to somebody else so that they can focus on hiring work, right? So, most marketing and IP legal tech space is sold on functional benefits, which is I'll help you save time, I'll make you more efficient. Your team can offload this work so that they can focus on higher end work, right? Or I can improve the efficiency of the current process that you have. So, for instance, uh, there is an IP litigation process, right? From the moment you file the patent to the time that patent is granted, right? There's a lot of work that needs to be done. There's a lot of paperwork that needs to be done, right? There's coordination that has to happen with the USP team, right? And if I can get into the process and help you to speed it up, make it more efficient and you save time, that is worth a lot of money. And this is what most IP services and product firms are solving for. Uh, so most IP tech today is sold on functional benefits. Beyond that, you can put some emotional benefits. Like you can say that you can focus on higher end work, which is essentially saying that I will help you to be more successful. Right? And this is not just IP tech and legal tech. Even for SaaS, it's all sold on functional benefit. So that's one of the reasons what happens is when you think about marketing and messaging, you're always thinking from the raster side, right? Like time, money, efficiency, right? This is what you keep talking about. At some level, you have to also appeal at an emotional level. So we do that by showing proof points. Like we did this for XYZ company and they were able to save 100% time. Right. And uh, if they can do it, you can also do it. So that's probably doing an emotional uh, way of sort of sending it to them. But yeah, that's generally how production services are pitched. Absolutely. Uh, well said. And you know, one thing I would like to add is that uh, because I've been part of both uh, type of lawyers. So what I'll say is that when it comes to in-house lawyers, right? So their thing is that 
they are employed, right? Their salary is fixed. Now, whatever the work comes in, right, they have to get it done. It doesn't matter if like, you know, uh, 10 units of work is coming in, is 100 units of work is coming in. Uh, they have to get the work done. And if it they request for extra resources, it will take at least a couple of months to come in, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you talk about the law firm lawyers, like for them, the billable hours is the king, right? Mm -hmm. All they care about is providing good service to the client or billing as much as possible. It's it's very yeah. simple in that yeah. way. Yeah. Right? So now, as you said, like, you know, when we talk about the functional aspects of selling the product, when you're selling to the law firm, you have to make them understand that we will increase your efficiency in a way that your billable hours will not go away, yeah. right? So yeah. that's something you need to kind of uh, make them understand as an outsider perspective or as an outsider service provider. Because if you are coming between them and their billable hours, you're not going to stand a chance. No, but I'll tell you what is happening in North America and Europe. I can't yeah. talk from an India perspective because uh, I'm not... I mean, dealt with a lot of clients in India. But uh, law firms, especially the large law firms in North America and Europe, they all want to sort of evolve. We have this term called green field project, right, where some of these law firms don't currently use any technology. So most of these law firms have some sort of a digital transformation project in place now, where they are seeing that we worked in a certain way, which is largely pen and paper. Now we want to transition to being a very digital savvy law firm. So what they're doing is they're largely partnering with companies in the schools. Not just us, but other firms also that can help them to become more efficient. There is a digital transformation process that all of these companies are adopting. They go by different names, but what they're trying to do is integrate technology so that they can make life simpler for their partners, who in turn can give better services to their client. So in turn, what they're doing is they are reimagining their existing relationship with their clients because the clients are also pushing law firms become more digital savvy, use AI, right? right? How do we become more efficient? And some of these law firms have crazy number of clients, right. large portfolio to manage, hiring paralegal staff in US has become very, very expensive, right? And uh, there was a large wave where outsourcing also started happening when pandemic happened. So I think these law firms are also evolving. They are also thinking about how do I prepare myself for a 5, 10, 15 years. Absolutely. But I would say the major credit on that is uh, going to the clients for pushing them. See, uh, because a, a law firm is actually being stressed from like I was 10 directions. Clients are always pushing to reduce the billable hours, right? Every year, as associate expects, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 percent hike in its salary. Every year, partner is asking for more share into the profit. And if you don't satisfy, you know, in either of the directions, they can leave. The clients can leave. Uh, the partner can take their clients and leave the firm. And associates, of, they can switch. So the law firms are definitely being stretched from all directions. And they're kind of forced to adapt. That's a very interesting topic that we covered. But one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you was the work that you have been doing with Digital Uncovered, right? And uh, that's what we were talking on our call. So tell us about the story there. What was your experience? So I started my career in 2009, uh, fresh out of MBA. And uh, somewhere in 2010, by then boss sort of entasked me with building the website. I had no idea about digital marketing. So I pretty much learned on the job and I had a finance degree. That's a separate story itself. So 2009, 2010, I started working on the website. We built the entire website using custom CMS. It took us four months time and we were among, among the first companies in India, which was selling educational courses online. So we were selling offline six month courses online to the website, right? Then we, the first year itself, we did a business of around 70 lakhs selling correspondence courses through the website. And while I was doing this and I was managing the website, then I took over performance marketing, did a bit of SEO. I was looking for resources that taught digital marketing from an Indian context, right? Because whatever happens in from a Western context, it doesn't apply in India because there is a lot of chaos and a lot of nuance to how marketing happens in India. So I started looking for websites that cover this from an Indian perspective and I couldn't find any. So I started writing and building my own site. Back then, it was a small place on Blogger. And until 2011 to 2015, it was more of a tiny blog on Blogger. And in 2015, what happened was I met Jeff Wilders. 
So Jeff Pulas is a very, very influential blogger. People know him even now. So he was a professor of English in some Australian university. And then he started writing about digital marketing. And at that point in time, his site had six, seven million visitors. I took a workshop that inspired me. And I started realizing that I should start spending on this and building this platform. And from 2016 to 2023, 24, I was I've been very, very active. So I published one piece of content every day. So much of what I've learned, I've learned on my own. I didn't have much help. And I made a lot of mistakes. So from 2011 to 2017, I had 100 people coming on the site every month. And then it grew. It became 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000, 6,000. And it also dipped when the recent core update happened. But I've learned a bunch. Now, if I have to grow it again, I know how to build it. Uh, and I think that's a muscle that you develop when you keep doing it over time. You can go attend courses, classes, but nobody will tell you the insider secrets of how to grow a site from 0 to 100, 200, 300,000 visitors. And you apply the same principles for podcasts and any other channel that you can think of. Yeah, well said. Like, you know, uh, in terms of growth, right? So how do you measure growth of a podcast or a content uh, platform or a blog other than numbers? Is there other metric that we should be also looking at? So... In the initial phase, I think just focus on being consistent. Because when I was writing content, I was not writing content for an audience. I was basically sharing whatever little I had learned at my job or otherwise. So the initial phase has to focus on being consistent. And when you are being consistent, also look at how do you sort of improvise what you are doing. So if you are creating an article, and let's say you are creating a long-form article which is 1000 words, how do you make sure that your writing gets better? How do you make sure that your thumbnail gets better? How do you make sure that internal linking is done right? How do you make sure that your website loads in less than three seconds? So if you are very being very thoughtful about how you are building it, right? In three, six months, what will happen is the quality of the content and uh, how it is placed on your website and how the site loads. If all of that improves over time, obviously you will start seeing results. And also the larger problem is that Google sort of puts you in a sandbox. When you, you are a fresh site and you start publishing a lot of content, you're not going to see results in the past six months, one year. And Google has denied for the longest time there is something called a sandbox, but the reason API and D sort of validates the fact that there was a sandbox. So they would put you in a sandbox in the past six months, one year. And once you are through that sandbox phase, they realize that you build trust, credibility, topical authority, then you slowly start ranking for relevant keywords and places. So that entire process to go from not having a website to creating a site to getting some traffic is at least two, two and a half years. That's the kind of time you need to get results. And this applies to all the platforms. Even on YouTube, for instance, uh, there are very few people who cracked it. It's going to take you at least one, one and a half, two years to see some sort of results from this. But in the interim, when you are doing this, your focus has to be on improving the quality. How do you get smaller things right? Because most of the time, if you're not getting traction, it could be a factor of your quality not being good, your thumbnail image is not being good, your title being wrong, or you not doing optimizing SEO from the right perspective. That is what will get you to where you want. Right. You know, a great suggestion, to be honest, right? But one of the problems that comes with this, right, you know, because of late, like, you know, we have always preached for the lean startup methodology of working style so the idea essentially is that you don't decide what is good your users decide what is good right so i think the biggest hurdle people face is that you know initial days when the feedback isn't there because as you said that the google or the youtube has put you in the sandbox the feedback isn't there so how do you decide that you are improving the internal matrices in the right way because you yourself has to decide and a lot of times we have preconceived notions about certain things that you know okay this will increase the quality which for a lot of times our users is, is not that important so what i used to do in the initial phase is i used to write a piece of content and share it with a couple of contacts so usually this used to happen through whatsapp and ask them whether they found value from it right so that was my internal dipstick of whether it is working or not Later on, what started happening is you started seeing some traction. So you had a few users or you had a few people coming on the site, some people leaving comments. So that gave you sort of some sort of feedback. But my approach to creating content has always, always been different. So I was never the kind of person who went and asked people, what should I create? 
I always created what I felt I should write about. Because I also think that taking too much user feedback, especially in content creation, is not helpful. Because you have to write things that you're confident about. So if you ask me to write about performance marketing today, I'm not be very comfortable writing about performance marketing because my experience understanding of performance marketing is very limited. So therefore, when I write about performance marketing, my content will come across as very shallow. Whereas if you ask me to write about B2B marketing, my expertise will be reflected in the content because I have first hand experience of doing that. Right. Uh, so most of the times I feel that you need perspective. Right. And that perspective will come from experience. That perspective will come from either consuming a lot of content around that particular topic or the perspective is going to come from other experts that you talk to. So if you are somebody who doesn't have hands on experience, you will have to talk to a couple of people in the space to sort of borrow from their perspective. So I feel that a lot of times if the content is not working out, it's because the person who's writing it, the content is coming across as very shallow. It doesn't reflect that person's perspective because this is what you should think about, right? Like everybody's writing about on-page SEO, for instance. The information about on-page SEO is universally available, right? And if you create a copy con piece of content that has been created by 10 other people, uh, your odds of ranking on that particular piece is very, very difficult. What makes your content different from any other content piece is your perspective or the way you present it, right? So two YouTube channels, same content, but one speaker is very enthusiastic, uses a lot of voice modulation when he speaks, does a much better job of editing. So I think two pieces, one is perspective and second is presentation. How is it presented? Even some subtle nuances in how you write content can make a huge difference as far as uh, how it gets perceived. Well said. And you know, uh, one of the things that I think is effective every industry is generative AI, right? So what are your thoughts on the future of marketing? That's a, that's a question that requires a long, very nuanced answer. So what has been happening for the last five, six years is that a lot of tactical work is getting replaced by generative AI. For instance, if you want to write a product description or you want to write a meta title or a meta description or you want a subject for an emailer, you use generative AI, right? You use OpenAI or you use Cloud or any of that is not language model out there. But what is happening over the last couple of years is that it has moved from text to images and video. So with multi-modality coming into place, you are using images and videos that are getting created by the AI. So from last year, say for instance, we started using Midjourney and Adobe Fire via our company. We've been using Adobe and uh, Midjourney to create images for some of our blog posts, some of our tactical content. So multi-modality has come into place. Now we are also using 11 Labs for creating audio content. So earlier the voiceovers were done by a TTS model, text-to-speech model. But now we are using 11 Labs, which is far more evolved and far more nuanced in its approach of how it does voice. And you can also use the model for cloning your own voice for creating videos. So one big change that has happened in the last couple of months, couple of years is multimodality. From creating text, which came from a large language model, you are also creating video and audio. The second change that will come, which might take time, is that a lot of long-form content is still produced pretty manually. It's all handcrafted. So in some time, you will also have some sort of a model which at least gives you a good first draft. So today, if you ask OpenAI to write a thousand word article, it doesn't do a great job, right? You have to go to perplexity, you have to go to three different sources, gather all the content and then piece it together. But I think in a couple of months and a couple of years, you'll see that large language models will get so good that they will also start doing scripts for videos, long form content and a lot of other content that you thought was not possible using that language. Now, there are a lot of other considerations to be thought of, like trademark infringement, copyright issues that could come from all of this. That's a separate discussion altogether to be had on this. But in general, what is going to happen, is, uh, marketing is going to get AI assisted. And there is a very interesting aspect that Scott Galloway shares. So he says that, Companies in the US are not saying there are job losses happening because of AI, because the bigger story is augmentation. So for instance, you as a copywriter can do three people's job now. So therefore, three people don't need to be hired because the first draft comes very, very easily to you. 
then all the refinement that has to be done on the second and third draft is much, much easier for you. So earlier, you would struggle with a blank page. You don't have an idea for a first draft. So augmentation is going to be a much, much bigger story as far as AI is concerned. And the uh, other thing also that is happening is a lot of people don't even know they are using AI. So if you use something like Canva today, Canva has AI integrated into it. It has stability AI model integrated. It has the run based video model integrated onto it. You wouldn't even realize that you're using AI. Right? So a lot of us, like Grammarly, for instance, you wouldn't even realize that you're using AI. So Grammarly has a large language model integrated with it now. Well said. And you know, one of the problems that I feel a lot of people struggling with is that now AI has made our job easier, no doubt about it, right? Now, should we be utilizing this efficiency gain in improving the quality or improving the quantity? So now the question is that, you know, okay, earlier I used to post one blog every day. Now I should be posting three blogs or using that efficiency gain to improve the quality of the end product that I deliver and keep the quantity as it was earlier. What are your thoughts on this? It's a tricky question to answer. Say, for instance, this quality versus quantity debate depends on what are you trying to do. So let's say I work with Flipkart. Every week, every month, I am adding 10,000 new products onto the platform. So for each product, I need to add title, descriptions, right? few images, all of that. Now, this kind of work, you will optimize for quantity. So, for instance, if you go to Paytm today, uh, there is a section for ONDC. ONDC section, all the images are generated by AI. What Vijay Shekhar Sharma was saying when I heard him a couple of months back is that they just have four product managers for the whole ONDC section. There are no designers. All the images are generated by AI. Any aspect where you need scale, right, like thousands of product descriptions, thousands of meta titles, thousands of meta art descriptions, right, Instead of you working with an agency which will employ 500, 600 people and take a couple of months to do this, you're better off doing this through AI and then refining it later. But any area where you need quality, you can't rely on it. You will have to have people who do manual checks. What AI might do is give you the outline, the initial outline to start so that you will start, you will start with a blank page. But you will have to optimize for quality. One very interesting example of this is Intercom, which is a very, very large brand based out of US. They recently did redid their entire website. They took an entire year to redo their website. Their website is full of illustrations, images, which have been handcrafted by illustrators. So I reached out to the VP of design at Intercom, Ruth Beta, and he said this entire process took a month. He worked with several illustrators and artists to do this. Now, obviously, he didn't explain the rationales behind it. But there is a lot of value for handcrafted content and images, even now. In an age of AI, where everything can be created through a click of button, my understanding is the value of a good hand-drawn artwork is only going to appreciate. Because when somebody sees it, he realizes that this is perhaps something that has not come out of mid-journey. Right? And in some time, you will also be able to make out what is real and what has come out of an image generated. So I feel that like thought leadership content, or if you are creating illustrations for your website, you might as well take some time and uh, handcraft it rather than using the net. Absolutely great advice, no doubt about it. So, Suraj, are you ready for the rapid fire round? Sure. Good. Okay. So, the first question is favorite marketing campaign of all time? And there are actually a lot of them. The one that comes to mind for most people is Amoni. In the US, you had uh, Apple, which is yeah. different. And then there is Scott Milk, which yeah. is the original campaign to Amun. Yeah, I think these are the ones that are very, very popular. There are a few other brands also I like, but like they've not been very consistent with their marketing campaigns, but they've done a great job. Like there is HubSpot, Gong, a couple of companies. Thread in India is doing great uh, work really? for the last couple of years. Absolutely. One book every marketer should read. The one that came to my mind was uh, On Writing by Stephen King. It's a part memoir, part uh, book on how to write well. I think that is something that gave me tremendous value when I started writing. So I think that's one book I could think of. Well said. Most inspiring business leader? Uh, there are many of them actually. Off late, it's been uh, Nitin Kamath. 
okay stays under the ground doesn't talk much does great work right yeah. the kind of person you want to be who's not in the limelight but does very great work absolutely one word to describe your work or leadership style i would say adventurous adventurous for the reason because i feel every 3 to 6 months you have to pump some energy into your team right pick up yeah. something that you've not done before uh because things can get very very boring in b2b <laughs> yeah only mm-hmm. that we were so you have to give them that electric shock at times by taking up some project that probably they didn't think they could do wow the next question is first thing you do in the morning chat what chat with chai 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 acha chai okay <laughs> Acha, <laughs> why I didn't ask? Like, are you a coffee or chai person? <laughs> you answered that in this question itself. So, what's your go-to source for marketing news? Oh, there are many of them actually. Um, there are some really good publications in India. There is Agency FAQs, uh, Best Media Info, Exchange for Media, Agency right. Reporter. Internationally, I look up to TechCrunch, Ad Age, and few other publications. Wow. as we are running out of time tell me like if you have to relearn the digital marketing space again in the context of ai and going around right now how would you relearn if you have to do it today i uh, see i think this is the advice that i give to my team also that you can take up some courses maybe do an mba program uh, maybe attend a few workshops but i think the best way to learn digital marketing is to do it by yourself and the simplest investment you can make is buy a hosting right create a website create content and see where it takes you initially you will struggle you wouldn't understand how to build a website so you will learn wordpress once you learn wordpress you will start learning how to create content once you understand how to create content you will start learning seo right i think the amount of uh, learning that will happen during that process is unparalleled compared to you doing some course which will teach you let's say how to do performance marketing but the best way to learn performance marketing is to run a campaign build a website run a performance marketing campaign and you learn more in the process obviously you struggle to put the pieces together you will have to do a bit of reading to understand what the structure should be once of what i have learned i have learned it on my own because what happens in a lot of companies is that say for instance you working with a large company they'll say okay we have to do seo so then you'll hire an agency the agency will do the seo for you the agency is never going to tell you how they did what they did here right? so the best way to learn all page is seo structure data technical seo page is used to do it yourself it might take you 6 months to learn it but once you learn it the agency that you're working with will also have a respect for you because they'll realize that this guy knows as much as we do right so, so i i think that process is lengthy but if you want to be in this for a long time uh, you will have to make sure your basics are very very strong well said and you know the use of ai will come naturally because whatever you are doing you will learn how to integrate ai in that particular process for instance like you know in the in the olden days you have to on your own think of like you know a catchy title for your blog now what you do is you you ask uh, the ai to generate 10 and uh, i would say 80% of the time one of them is just good enough and you say like this is what i like otherwise 20% of them you get inspiration and then you are able to come up something on your own yeah yeah no i i know people who are very very smart uh, if you know how to do prompt engineering well and you have a enterprise version of chat gpt you can create a custom gpt so say for instance you have 10 blog articles you want to generate the entire meta description for all 10 of those you can build a custom gpt plug this in and this is done in matter of seconds so i am sure the kids these days are very very smart they they always will look for a shortcut to get things done faster unlike us because we were basically googling going through 10 links before we figured out how to do something <laughs> right and back in 2010 11 you would always have that one friend you will call and i yeah. have to do this how do i do this right right i think now there's not much dependence because you can go to perplexity perplexity doesn't give the answer you go to open ai if you open ai doesn't give the answer you go somewhere else yeah and yeah i mean i remember when i was setting up my website long back right we don't know the difference between what a c name and a txt record is so you go to some person so back then it was bluehost so they had an office in bangalore we'll call them 
how do I do the seed in TXT record? Because you don't understand any significance of any of that. But I think this is the gist of it. So you think of it. You have a website which has some content. Then you have the front end, and then you have the back end, right? And then you have somebody who does SEO, and then you have a fifth person who's running some campaigns through some marketing automation platform like Up. When you go to a company, in which company will you get to manage all of this, right? Because you usually will get one piece of the job. You'll get marketing automation, right? So you don't understand front end, you don't understand back end, you don't understand half of how things are done, right? So if you manage your own site, you understand how to use WordPress. You have a hosting provider who's subs, let's say supposedly Blue Post, right? Then you are working with them to see how do I optimize the images. Right? Do you have some capability that helps me to do that? Because that is part of technical SEO. And then you have marketing automation platforms. You also also have to learn HubSpot or some tool that you are learning. So I think this is the gap I see nowadays, right? Like to get one person who knows all of this, he is then in command because. Uh, one of the things that used to happen is like some brute force attack happened. Uh, the hosting provider will do is it directly block your port. So you have to go and open the port, right? So then you have to figure out how do I stop these brute force attacks from happening? Then you understand there is something called a firewall. Okay, the firewall has to be integrated with the side. Right? So and now you think of it as saying, oh, this is not my problem. This is not ID team. The ID team is supposed to do all of this. Right? That's what we generally think. Right? But if you know this, your IT team will have a lot of respect for you. Right? So the difference between using a Cloudflare versus a Sukuri, what is the cost involved? Right? And how does a Cloudflare stop brute force attacks and DDoS attacks and all that, those things that can happen? I had so many instances because I was so naive, right? Created a WordPress site, put some content, then the website took off, and then all sorts of attacks start happening. Right, and that's when you start digging deep. Okay, why are so many DDoS attacks happening? And every time there is a DDoS attack, the hosting provider will block your port. Right, so you have to clean up your site. Then they will unblock the port. Only then traffic will come to your site. Right, so I think these are all things that you only learn when you do something of your own. You'll never know this if you do some course because again, you'll say, "Why IT will manage the website? Yeah, what's not my attention?" Yeah, do this or join a startup. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another way to learn this. Because right. in a startup, you will be everything, right? You are the CEO, you are the janitor. Yeah, that's exactly true. Yeah. So people who are like, you know, here as a content marketer, they also know everything from uh, A to Z. So Suraj, thanks a lot for coming on the podcast, sharing your story and your, you know, marketing insights. It was very informative, very engaging, I must say. Thanks for having me, Abhinash. I think uh, it took me a while to reply to your email. Uh, <laughs> but I did see it uh, and I eventually got to it. So thanks, we got to do this. <laughs> Completely our pleasure. Thanks uh, again. Thanks, yeah. Take care. Bye. That brings us to the end of this fascinating episode of the Yes Users podcast. A huge thanks to Suraj Divakaran for sharing his incredible journey and invaluable insights with us. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe, leave a review and share this podcast within your network. Stay tuned for more inspiring stories and expert advice from industry leaders. Until next time, keep saying yes to learning and yes to your users' feedback. Thanks a lot for listening.